our prayer is that you would come quickly. How we long to be with you. When we think about who we are and what we deserve, and we think about what you have done in your love for us, we are amazed, humbled, eager to lay our lives before you and serve you. We pray in these next few moments as we sit under your word that you would be honored, that you would be seen, that your voice would be heard. Even as we focus on one of your choice servants, the Apostle Paul, we recognize that everything he had that was not rubbish was of your grace. And so we lift up not him, but we see through him to your kind ways, your supernatural power at working through blunt instruments to accomplish your infinite purposes. Give us hearing, O Lord, this morning and soft hearts before your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be in Acts chapter 20 this morning. My kids asked me last night, are we back in Romans? No. Oh, Dad. That's encouraging. Romans is an old friend, and Lord willing, we'll be back in Romans next week. I, I want to turn our attention to Acts chapter 20, and uh, you can be turning there in your Bibles. Before we dig into it this morning, I just want to highlight uh, three things that are significant, uh, momentous happenings in our church body. And, and of course, we've all walked together uh, with the Kelsos in the last couple of weeks. Caleb's memorial service has been posted on the church website. You can view that there. Uh, we will continue to pray for them. Uh, these are events, uh, feelings, emotions, circumstances um, that we'll be walking with for a long time. I have heard rumors that the Hantlas uh, are on their way back to Arizona. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. You've seen Jake in and out here, but uh, Kiki and the kids, uh, last I saw, were in California and getting ever closer. You know, they've been in Seattle for little David's very specialized cancer treatments. And I think what I heard is they've been away from here for 240 plus days. Uh, that's a long time. So... Um, Lord willing, we'll get to see them uh, this week, maybe even next Sunday, and um, you can continue to pray for them. Thankfully, David's treatment is at a place where they can make this trip and come back here. Um, so we're thrilled about that, a monumental moment for us as a church. And then thirdly, um, just to highlight again what our dear friends are doing in Papua New Guinea. You know that November 1st, uh, Team Doe, the Cans, the Mitchells, Amelia, uh, what the Dodds were a part of, um, will begin chronological Bible teaching. After 12 years of preparation and training and learning multiple languages, assembling the team, after all of us participating financially and in prayer and in various labors, the day has finally come to open God's truth in the Doe language and to begin to teach the gospel from Genesis forward leading up to Christ. That's a process of two hours a day, five days a week, November 1st up through January. And I just want to press upon us again, this is a time to pray. This is a time to pray for them. It, it may be that uh, our dear friends there sow seeds that they never see the fruit of. It is quite possible, and, and many missionaries have experienced this, have go through all the training, all the preparation, all the learning, all the hardship, all the trials, and proclaim the word, and there remains what looks like barren ground. And so we must pray that God will sustain them in this because their labors are a sweet aroma before the Lord, regardless of what we may see in terms of temporal outcomes. It is inevitable that tribal peoples from the mountains of Papua New Guinea will surround the throne of the Lamb. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? that Jesus has purchased with his own blood people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. And so perhaps other servants later on may reap the harvest that our dear friends have sown. And we pray for that. But perhaps 
perhaps God would open the hearts of the dough people en masse as they hear God's word, as they hear about a savior and the church might be born. Let's pray for that. Um, Joey Tartaglia has, uh, is working on uh, a prayer calendar that will go up on the Finisterre Vision website this week where you can sign up for a slot to pray. And it would be wonderful just to cover the time, really between now and January, with intercession on behalf of our team, intercession on behalf of the Doe people, um, that the gospel would be faithfully proclaimed, understood, heard, believed, and the church birthed. So look for that on the Finister Vision website and be praying. I trust you found the book of Acts by now and Acts chapter 20. We're going to be looking specifically at Paul's address to the Ephesian pastors there. And, and there's a more detailed outline on the website if you want to download that. Um, it has a lot more of the information filled in than what you'll see on the screens behind me. We're going to cover a lot of material. I might talk too fast for my own good. Um, but I, I, I want to have us... Um, have an opportunity to have a window this morning into the Apostle Paul, his heartbeat, his life, his ministry. This will help us get back into Romans, if the Lord allows us next week to do that. This will also give us a window into pastoral ministry generally. What, what are pastors like or what should they be like? And also a window into what it is like for a faithful shepherd to leave a ministry that he loves, to depart from people that he loves, as the Lord leads him to do ministry somewhere else. And this morning at the end of our service, we have the opportunity to install Jonathan Anderson as a pastor at Grace Bible Church. And I couldn't help but think of this passage as we're walking through this process together because I know some of what John and April left to be here. And it would be helpful for us to maybe catch a glimpse of that. Now, some of what we're going to find in this chapter is very particular to the Apostle Paul. Uh, some of it is applicable more broadly and has import for all pastors, but the entirety of this passage is beneficial for all of us to ponder this morning. We get a glimpse of what selfless shepherding ministry looks like, what pastors in local churches ought to aim for, and what local Christians ought to pray for in their pastors. And my heart was drawn to this passage as I watched the send-off service at Grace Emanuel Bible Church in Jupiter, Florida a few Sundays ago, where they sent off the Anderson family to a place far away called Arizona. And we're going to be putting a link of that service up on our website this week. And I just want you to know it's hard for John and April to leave Florida. It was hard for that ministry to send John and April and the four boys to us. And I think it's important for us to get a glimpse of that, and I would encourage you to watch that send-off service. As I watched, I couldn't help but think of the scene in Acts 20 where the Apostle Paul said goodbye to the elders of the church at Ephesus, a place he had served for three years among men he had loved and men and women and children in a church that he had loved and labored for. There are some parallels that I think will be obvious. It's not a perfect match. John is not the Apostle Paul. And hopefully John has not left a sweet, fruitful ministry for chains and afflictions that await him in Jerusalem. <laughs> we hope the parallel breaks down at some significant points. Let's read together our text this morning, beginning of verse 17 of Acts 20. God writes this through Luke. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, 
saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course on the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and a day, that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my own needs and to the men who are with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they began to weep aloud. They embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. The Apostle Paul summoned the pastors at Ephesus to encourage them in their ministry. That's what this passage is about. There are essentially three scenes, three parts of this encouragement. It's really straightforward in terms of an outline. Paul assembled the pastors, Paul addressed the pastors, and then he left the pastors. We're going to spend most of our time on the second point, which is Paul's address of the pastors. But let's look first at verse 17. Paul assembled the Ephesian elders. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called to him the elders of the church. And Paul meets them at the beach of the town of Miletus. It's Oceanside. It's 30 miles south of Ephesus. And Paul is trying to make it to Jerusalem before the Jewish celebration of Pentecost. He does not want to get waylaid in Asia, and you know Paul. If he were to walk to Ephesus, he would be around the people that he'd love. He'd have long conversations. Uh, you know what happened with Eutychus. Uh, Eutychus listening to Paul open the word of God all night long and fell asleep and fell out of a window. <laughs> I mean, there would be Eutychuses everywhere. People would be falling out of windows left and right. Paul would never make it to Jerusalem. He doesn't want to get slowed up. So while the ship was stopped for a few days at Miletus, he summoned the elders of the church at Ephesus to meet him at the beach. He's going to talk to them about ministry. And they are called here the elders. Elsewhere in this passage, they are called the overseers, the episkopos. They are told to watch, to guard, and to shepherd the flock of God, which is the church they are called to care for. Their task is called Shepherding. Our English word pastor is simply from the Latin word pastor, which translates the idea of shepherding in this text. These are the elders, the overseers, the pastors, the shepherds, the group of men placed by the Holy Spirit, qualified and equipped to shepherd God's church at Ephesus. And Paul summoned them to himself. English doesn't quite capture the, the weightiness of this request. When I heard the sentence, Smedley Yates, Please report to the principal's office immediately. Smedley Yates, please report to the... You knew that was a serious meeting. A serious conversation was about to go down. I was called a number of things as a kid. Son, sonny boy, pal, buddy, buckaroo, buckaroo bobcat, Sam Wilford, bozo, Smedley, Smed, Andy. But when I heard Andrew Edward Yates... A serious conversation was about to ensue. 
A number of years ago, I was summoned to a deposition, a room full of lawyers and a stenographer, a Bible. Not that we were going to have a Bible study. They just wanted me to put my hand on it and make promises. And I had to give testimony under oath concerning a legal case. This was solemn and serious. Paul has asked the Ephesian pastors to come down to Miletus and have a conversation with him. This is serious, urgent, sobering. Three times in this text, Paul says, I solemnly testify. And in verse 26, he says, I testify to you this day. There is weeping. There are warnings. This is a serious conversation, an urgent conversation. And through it, we get a window into the life and the heart of the Apostle Paul. So let's look. The second major heading here this morning is Paul's address of the Ephesian elders. And we're going to look at it in seven parts. This is verses 18 through 35. And it begins with Paul's reminder in verse 18. When they came to him, he said to them, and here begins Paul's speech, you yourselves know, you yourselves know. The Ephesian elders are, are being brought into what they already know of Paul. And, and Paul is saying this emphatically, you, you, you guys, yourselves, you know this. And he highlights two things that they knew of him. The first is his manner of ministry in verses 18 and 19, and then the content of his ministry, his teaching, in verses 20 and 21. And here's how Paul describes the manner of his ministry. It was constant, tireless, Christward, humble, empathetic, and tested. It was constant. Verse 18, he says, From the first day I set foot in Asia, and I was with you the whole time. It was tireless. He says, I was serving, uh, literally slaving. And it was Christward. That is, he was serving the Lord Jesus. He, he didn't have a ministry built on man-pleasing or fear of man or some sort of man-centeredness. And his ministry was humble. He says, with all humility, verse 19. This is the only place in the New Testament that Paul says he was humble. It was empathetic. He said, with tears, verse 19. And it was tested. Look at verse 19. With the trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Those aren't highlighted here, but they are highlighted in a couple other places. Paul was tested at Ephesus by his own countrymen. He causes the Ephesian pastors to remember not only the manner of his ministry, but also his teaching. And his teaching was fearless, thorough, public, personal, indiscriminate, and evangelistic. Notice what he says in verses 20 and 21. How I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He uses verbs to announce and to teach and solemnly testifying. He's talking about his handling of the word of God, teaching the truth of God. And it was fearless. He says, I did not shrink from declaring in verse 20. We're going to see this word again in verse 27 that's going to help fill out exactly what it was that Paul taught. Here, this idea of shrinking back is to hesitate, to hold back, to hold things back. And Paul said, I didn't hold anything back. Paul pulled no punches. He was fearless in this, and he was thorough. He says, I didn't hold back anything profitable, verse 20. And, and verse 27 is going to tell us that what was profitable was precisely the whole counsel of God. Everything that God had disclosed. Paul was not going to tailor his teaching to the whims of the people, nor to his favorite Bible verses, nor to his favorite theological topics. He was not going to teach in fear of what people think. He was going to give the church everything. He had done that at Ephesus. And when you combine the implications of verse 20 and verse 27, we see that all of Scripture, that is the whole counsel of God, all that God has revealed to us in his word, all of it is profitable. All of it is profitable. And so Paul was committed in his teaching to giving the church everything God had said, not holding anything back. His teaching was public. Notice he says, teaching you publicly, verse 20. 
Early on in the synagogue and in the hall of Tyrannus, Paul spoke publicly. His message was not clandestine meetings of some secret Gnostic information. It was public proclamation of God's truth. It was costly for him. It was not only public, but it was also personal. Notice in verse 20, Paul says, I taught from house to house. That is, down to a personal level. Paul was not just a famous public speaker that was on the clock only when large crowds were gathered. No, he cared about people as individuals. He met in individual households and taught from house to house. It was indiscriminate. He solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks, verse 21. Um, Paul was not showing favoritism in his teaching. And it was evangelistic. Notice what he says in verse 21. Solemnly testifying to Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, Paul did not soft pedal an offensive message. That you're sinners, hopeless, helpless, and dead, and you need a Savior who is the Lord Jesus Christ. That the only way that a sinner can be reconciled to a holy God is through a crucified Messiah. And faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin of a saving response to this message. You turn from idols to the true and living God. You turn from sin to Christ. Becoming a Christian requires a 180 degree turn. It's that day when you say, take the world, give me Jesus. It's that day when you count the cost and you say, what would it profit me to gain the whole world and forfeit my soul? I'll take Christ. It means a turning from one's old life to a new life in Jesus Christ. There's a close relationship between these two. Paul was not preaching an easy believism that you just assent to some facts about a savior and then get a get out of hell free card. He preached the truth of the gospel, repentance and faith. The second part of Paul's address, letter B in our outline, is Paul's forecast. Paul's forecast, we see that in verse 22 and 23. Paul says, and now behold, check this out, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me that in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Paul says two things. I don't know what's going to happen, and I know some of what's going to happen. If you've experienced fear or anxiety about the unknown future, Paul knew that. If you've experienced fear and anxiety about the known future, Paul faced that too. And what's interesting here is that Paul is compelled. He says, bound by the Spirit, and then verse 23 ends with, bonds and afflictions await me. So, yeah, is Paul going to get a, a chain and a guard, some soldiers and some shackles from humans? Sure. But his heart has already been shackled by his divine commission, by his role as apostle to the Gentiles, by his love for his countrymen, and by his slavery to Christ. He is, in fact, freer than all his captors would be. He knows that. Still, this is hard. His forecast would seem bad news to the Ephesian pastors. But that leads really to the way Paul viewed his own life. This is letter C. This is the third part of Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. And it is his priority. Look at verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. There's a hard contrast here. Uh, grammatically and, and in the ideas that Paul is portraying. Bonds and afflictions await me. That's going to crimp anyone's lifestyle. But the contrast to that is Paul does not consider his life of any account as dear to himself so that I may finish my course in the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of God's grace. Paul welcomes the hardships of ministry because he was radically committed to that ministry as entrusted to him by Jesus. And listen, the only way Paul would fulfill that ministry is if he was emptied of personal ambition. 
But there's an important grammatical connection between the two ideas in verse 24. The first idea Paul gives us is self-forgetfulness. Uh, my life is no of account to me. <laughs> Who thinks like that other than an otherworldly transformation in the heart that learns to forget self? And the second part of it is that I may finish my course in the ministry I received. This is fruitful ministry or faithful ministry. Notice how these two ideas are connected in verse 24 with a so that. Do you see it there? Forget self in order to faithfully serve. Forget self, put to death selfish ambition in order to or so that I can be successful in this task Jesus gave me. His course, his path, his calling, his occupation was to solemnly testify of the good news, the gospel of the grace of God. And his success would depend in great degree on his self-assessment. If his own life were dear to him, he would fail at his ministry. He'd run from chains, run from afflictions, ameliorate pain and discomfort. If his own life, his reputation, his health, his safety, his comfort, his status, his standard of living, or the fulfillment of some personal dream, if these things became dear to him, he would compromise the mission that was given to him by God. Fourthly, letter D, we see Paul's assurance. And what I mean by that is Paul's assurance to the Ephesian elders. Look at verse 25. Now behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why? For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Paul is assuring the Ephesian pastors that I've given you what you need. And he begins by telling them, you're not going to see me again. Why, why does Paul tell them they will not see him again? It is possible, by the way, that some of them may have seen him again later on another journey. But why does he tell them this here? He says, you have what you need from me. You have what you need from me. You might be sad that I'm leaving. My apostolic ministry is going somewhere else. But Ephesian pastors, you have the word of God. In fact, in Ephesians 2.20, the apostle Paul himself says the apostles and New Testament prophets are the foundation of the church. That is, New Testament doctrine is the foundation of the church, not the man himself. Not, not Paul uh, as a man would be what the Ephesians had, and as soon as Paul was gone, the church at Ephesus is wrapped up. Paul says, I've given you what you need, and, and he lays out for them the content and his example and the motive for their ministry. The content is all of God's word. Notice, first of all, what he says, behold, verse 25, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, Paul in an ongoing fashion with the Ephesian elders, was preaching the kingdom. You might have expected him to say, Paul was preaching the gospel outline. That is, the way of salvation. Just tell me what I need to do to get into heaven. Um, that was not the totality of the content of Paul's message. He's talking about something bigger than the gospel. The gospel qualifies people to be kingdom citizens, but there is a kingdom coming, and Paul proclaimed it. Paul regularly in all the churches sends letters to churches and reminds them what he taught them in person, which goes way beyond a plan of salvation. And here he talks about having preached the kingdom among them in an ongoing way. And then notice verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. All of God's self-disclosure. All of God's word. Not enough to preach a favorite passage. Or else you will have impoverished Ephesians. And so what do the Ephesian believers need? They needed pastors equipped with the whole counsel of God. 
They needed pastors equipped to handle all of God's word. And Paul is saying, I'm not going to see you anymore, but I'm innocent of the blood of men because I gave you God's word. That's his point. This is a staggering statement. He even invokes the uh, Ezekiel 33, uh, uh, the watchman and God's messenger is accountable for the blood of people if he neglects God's word, holds back, shrinks back, doesn't tell him the truth. Paul invokes that imagery, some of that language here. It's really remarkable, and, and we see Paul's uh, content is all of the word of God. His example is fearless, thorough proclamation of God's word. That's the example the Ephesian elders should follow. And that's the example pastors in local churches should follow. And then the motive in verse 26 is highlighted. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men because I didn't shrink back. This gets to Paul's heartbeat, his motive behind ministry and faithful proclamation of the whole of God's word. Love for people. People will die apart from knowing God's word and die eternally. And fear of God. That is accountability, responsibility. Paul knows he will answer to the Lord. Even as the language he picks up from Ezekiel. Ezekiel knew he would answer to the Lord. If he was not faithful with God's message. Letter E, number five. The fifth element here of Paul's address to the pastors is Paul's warning. We see this in verse 28 and following. Be on guard for yourselves and for the, all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know, verse 29, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Verses 28 to 31 is a command sandwich. There's a command in verse 28, there's a command in verse 31, and the stuff in the middle is the warning. It's the reason why these commands are so critical. The first command in verse 28 is protect God's flock. Guard it. Keep watch over it. And specifically, watch yourselves and the flock. Now, that's so critical. Pastors need to be pastored. Shepherds need to be shepherded. The men needed to watch out for each other. To be on guard for each other's benefit. To watch themselves. And to watch the flock. And notice in verse 28, it's the flock that they are among. That is real pastoral ministry, real shepherding, real oversight is proximity shepherding. It's not away from, it's not distanced, it's not contracted out. And notice Paul says, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you, elders. Uh, literally placed you. That is the Holy Spirit selects, qualifies, and equips men who are the shepherds in local churches. And he made you overseers. Episcopos. Epi and scope, the idea is to look over, to oversee. And all of this is shepherding language. Again, the, the, the word pastors are just our English word for shepherd. Um, these are the shepherds, the overseers, the elders. Uh, elder is something like the title. Uh, the ministry of that man is shepherding ministry. And part of the job description is oversight. And all of those combined here in this charge Notice whose flock this is in verse 28. Whose church is it? It's not Paul's. It doesn't belong to the Ephesian elders. This is the church of God. And the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. That's the New American Standard. Um, it is possible to read the original text here, which God purchased with the blood of his own. In other words, which God purchased the church with the blood of Jesus. That's another way to read this text. Either way, you recognize that the church does not belong to Paul. This is a critical ministry because sheep are precious to God. They are precious and vulnerable. While sheep are precious and vulnerable, shepherds are placed and accountable. They're placed by God and accountable to God. And, and by contrast, wolves are reckless and ruthless and sneaky. 
the reason for this command sandwich, verse 29, there are infiltrators and elder traitors. Infiltrators, those are the outside threat. They come in and the elder traitors are the inside threat. The wolves are those sneaky outsiders. And notice they're sneaky because Paul says, after my departure, that is, <laughs> we're just waiting for Paul to leave, lurking around on the outskirts, waiting for their opportunity, and they are ruthless. They enter in among you. And look, wolves aren't there in the flock to make friends. I, I wish we could just all get along, sheep. You know, predation is so last year. Let's be friends. Look, no wolf sees a sheep as a friend. A sheep is cotton candy on four little sticks. It's easy pickings when the shepherds aren't looking. That's what a wolf is after. And they are reckless. They are here in verse 29, not sparing the flock. They don't care about the sheep. They do not love people. What do they love? They love themselves. That's the outside threat. And perhaps more insidious is the inside threat. Look at verse 30. And from among your own selves, Ephesian pastors. Yikes. Men will arise. The verb here to arise has some self-interest embedded in it. You could read this in an expanded way. Men will arise for themselves, for their own benefit. They will be speaking perverse or twisted things. That which is twisted, taking the truth and even making it their own shape. For what purpose? End of verse 32. Draw away the disciples after them. They're willing to twist the word of God for selfish ambition, selfish gain. Maybe a reputation, maybe a name. Uh, maybe they just want a following or perhaps monetary gain. And so the command sandwich concludes in verse 30 with this. Imitate my shepherding, Paul says. Verse 31, excuse me. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering. And he's provoking their memories back to the example that Paul had given them. Verse 31, night and, a day, night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. What was Paul shepherding? Ceaseless, vigilant, empathetic, personal admonishment. It was ceaseless. Go on remembering, Ephesian elders, that for three years, night and day, and he commands them, keep watch. It's vigilance. It's to be empathetic. Paul did this with tears. It's to be personal. Each one, each sheep. And it is admonishment. That is the word for addressing the mind with warnings, instructions, specifically counsel against danger. Listen, it's not a comfortable part of shepherding ministry, of pastoral ministry, to always be warning about danger. Sheep, don't go out there. Look what's across the fence. See the fangs? Don't go there. Don't tell me what to do. I love you. Stop telling me what to do. There's wolves. It's not the fun part of pastoring. But it is so critical because God's people are precious and vulnerable. And so Paul didn't cease doing this. Ceaseless, vigilant, empathetic, personal admonishment. Look, don't get offended when your pastor says, hey, can I ask you about something? Your pastors ask each other those same questions. It's what they're supposed to do. Letter F in the outline, the, what number, A, B, C, D, E, F, six. The sixth portion of Paul's address is a handoff in verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. To commend here, Paul is entrusting to God the Ephesian people and the Ephesian elders for safekeeping, for care, and for protection. Paul says, I commend you or I entrust you for safekeeping to God and to God's word. You know what that says about Paul? It's just not about him. Ministry was never about him putting his name on a plaque, the first church of Paul. No, this was God's church 
And if it was going to be sustained, if it was going to make it through to the end, cause them to be built up and to receive the inheritance, that's the lifespan of the church and the finish line. If the church is going to make it, it would be because God did it. And God's word did it. Not any one individual man. By the way, the church doesn't have a good record of this being located to one individual local church, right? The church at Ephesus today isn't what it was in Paul's day. In fact, you can read the pastoral epistles and then the book of Revelation, and you can go to modern Turkey today and look for this church and not find it. But God has kept his church alive, manifested in local assemblies, under faithful shepherding, proclaiming the whole counsel of God's word. And God would do that, and God's word would do that. It's not Paul's resources that would sustain, grow, and preserve the church. The church is never to be centered around a personality. The faithful shepherds that remained at Ephesus would be entrusted to God and to his word. That requires the perspective that Paul laid out in verse 24. I don't consider my own life of any account dear to myself. But self-emptying... Forgetting self, I'm able to successfully do what God has called me to do. And then last part of Paul's address is his example, verses 33 to 35. I'll just sum it up this way. Integrity, hard work, and selfless sacrifice. Paul knew that ministry was not for personal gain, and he lived that out by example. That brings us to the close of this section Paul assembled the elders, then he addressed the elders. We just finished Paul's address, and now Paul will leave them. Paul will leave them. Verse 36, after Paul said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them. Sum this up. Paul prayed, they cried, they kissed, they walked into the boat. (laughs) They wrapped themselves around his neck, and they wept on him, and they repeatedly kissed him. What does that tell you about the Apostle Paul? He was no austere, ivory tower, theologian, public speaker above the hoi polloi, distant from people. He was a man of affections, and people had affections for him. He loved, and he was loved. Grace Bible Church um, has had in its DNA the equipping of the saints and the passing the baton of leadership in the church to men, of training up elders, raising up pastors. And there are a number of the pastors at Grace Bible Church were pastors raised up internally. Uh, Some of them never having been a Christian anywhere other than Grace Bible Church. And many of the pastors here only having been pastors here. Jacob Handla, Eric Martin, Josh Kelso, Matt Kelso, Scott Demarest, Denny Pagel, and Omri Miles have all been trained up in this church to pastoral ministry. And that process continues through the various means of discipleship of men in the church that God might be pleased to raise up and the Holy Spirit might be pleased to appoint men as shepherds in the church. And then there are faithful shepherds that have come from outside of GBC, Tom Angstead was an outsider. Scott Maxwell came from the outside. I came from Nashville. I guess that's outside. Ashley Anderson came from the outside. And now Jonathan Anderson joins our pastoral team here. At times in the history of the church, we have acutely felt the need for more qualified shepherds. And really for several years now, the elders have talked about, prayed about what kind of man might we look for outside of GBC to supplement our shepherding. And at several points in the process of thinking through kinds of men and even specific names of men, something cropped up and and it became affectionately called the John Anderson template. (laughs) I wonder if we could get a, a guy like John Anderson. I mean, he can preach, he can teach, he loves church history, he's good in the original languages, he teaches at the seminary level and can train pastors, he counsels, um, and we could, we could use another shepherd. Well, we'll just use that as a template and look for somebody. Uh, let me give you John's resume credentials. 
I skipped over the, so how did the template become the reality? That's for another time. Let me tell you a little bit about John in terms of a resume. He is Kansas born and he is a Chiefs fan. Yeah, that, was, that just kind of went over like a lead balloon, John. Did you see that? You're just going to have to add the Cardinals to your repertoire. That's, that's my advice to you. John has a bachelor's in Bible and theology from the Moody Bible Institute. God bless the school. Uh, you Moody grads can appreciate that. Um, he has a master's of divinity from the master's seminary, and he has a PhD in Christian preaching with research and hermeneutics from the Southern Baptist Seminary. John and April were married in 2002. Uh, they have four sons, Micah, Owen, Miles, and Derek. From 2005 to 2020, John served as one of the pastors at Grace Emanuel Bible Church in Jupiter, Florida. And he has been a professor at the Expositor Seminary since its inception. John has taught Greek, church history, and other disciplines at the seminary level. Let me tell you a little bit about John personally. For 21 years or so, Jonathan and I have lived somewhat parallel lives. We overlapped in seminary. We did some ministry together. He let me marry his sister. Janet and I moved to Nashville, and a couple years later, John and April moved to Florida. And for the last 18 years, John has been to me a constant encouragement and a good friend. He is the pastor that I would call most readily to talk through theology, exegesis, the state of the church, talk about my own sin, talk about counseling issues, church difficulties. He has been throughout my life a good friend. And let me just give you a definition of a good friend. He's that person who knows you, who walks through life with you, whose love for Christ is infectious, that friend whose very presence makes you want to read your Bible more, hate your sin more, long for heaven more, and love your Savior more. And John has been that friend to me. And John's love for God's Word is contagious. In large part because of John, I have loved the study of the Bible's original languages. I have loved church history. I have collected and read obscure tomes that collected dust in European libraries. John has, in fact, introduced me to a whole host of new friends, most of whom are absent from the body and present with the Lord. But friends in print, men whose books disciple future generations in the truths of the Word of God. I would love to highlight for you John's specialization. What's he really good at? But he is gifted in many things. He's a humble shepherd who loves people. He's a gifted counselor. He's a professor studied in the biblical languages. He's a church historian. He's a skilled preacher. He has a relentless commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John has a relentless commitment to the authority, the power, and the clarity of God's word. John has, throughout his life, had, throughout his believing life, had an insatiable desire to help God's people understand God's word rightly, that God's people might know him. Now, watching that um, send-off service from Jupiter, Florida, I know John was embarrassed by the accolades as he left. Um, Now he's embarrassed by the accolades as he arrives. And uh, those accolades in Florida, John, are fond memories. I'm, I apologize to you now. Those accolades here become expectations. <laughs> but I am confident of God's work through you in April will surpass what I could possibly express this morning. We are so thankful to have you. Uh, as John joins us here at GI, at GI, I said it. The extra letter came out. As John joins us here at GBC, you might see a few more neckties around, um, but I know what you're going to see is a love for Christ. You're going to love church history more, it's inevitable. You're going to love your Bible more, but you are going to love your Savior more. I'm going to ask the elders to come up, and uh, not all of the guys could be here today, but you men who are here uh, and in this room, why don't you come up? John, would you come up? And uh, we're going to lay hands on you um, in gratitude to God. Um, We talked a lot about the Apostle Paul this morning. I talked a little bit about you. It's not really about you. It was never about Paul. 
Um, we're just thankful to God's grace and um, of his provision. Um, he obviously loves this church, and we're so thankful. So, uh, Ashley, could I get you to come up here? I'm going to put you on the spot. Would, uh, would you just pray as we lay hands on John and install him as a pastor at Grace Bible Church? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to add someone to our elder board and someone to our church who will continue the good work here, who will continue to build up the church and to cause the growth that, that uh, only the, the body itself can produce. And we pray, Father, that as he transitions here, that uh, you will give grace and strength to, to serve, to minister. And I just pray for our church that we will all benefit and be open to the, the truth and, and have a heart that will receive truth in a way that honors you and glorifies you. We do thank you now for your grace and all that you've done and that you continue to do here in this church. In Jesus' name.